All right. So we're we're right at noon. So let's jump off. So we have plenty of time for uh, for our community arts to provide their information to us. I'm Jill Williamson, the chair of the Legal and Regulatory Committee. Welcome to our LinkedIn Live uh, addressing data protection laws and regulations as they impact members of the esports industry. Uh, I'm an attorney and principal at the law firm of Gravis Law and a member of the emerging technology practice and head of the firm's regulatory practice. The committee, the legal and regulatory committee is responsible for creating best practice guidelines as well as taking on policy and providing legal education and regulatory resources. This is a first of a series of LinkedIn lives we have planned to cover legal and regulatory topics of interest to members of ESTA. We plan to present a program on intellectual property next. Our hope is to make the committee's agenda driven by member needs. So if you would like to lend your expertise in one of our LinkedIn lives, would like to join our committee, or have a topic you think would be good for us to cover, please feel free to reach out via info at es esportsta.org. Uh, Lindsay's going to drop that in the chat. Um, or take a few minutes and fill out our poll, which Lindsay will drop the link for that in our chat. I'm going to introduce our two speakers today, and we'll, we're going to use sort of a uh, fireside chat format. Feel free to drop any comments or questions into the, the chat, and uh, Lindsay's going to help us uh, address those questions either as the topics come up or at the end of our Q&A. We'll, we'll leave some time at the end of our presentation for Q&A. First, I'd like to introduce Shireen Damineri. She's an experienced attorney and certified privacy professional. Her law practice focuses on privacy, data protection, esports, technology, and business law. She is the ESTA Dallas Chapter Co-Chair and the Chapters Committee Co-Chair and a member of the Legal and Regulatory Committee. Nicholas is the founder and CEO of Sonics App, a tech startup developing a new type of ultra low latency communication app for esports teams and in app marketplace for their fans. Nicholas has spent the last 15 years developing consumer oriented solutions, both from the hardware side with AR glasses and the software side with Sonics to better to enable better communication between remote people as if they were close to each other. Nicola is a member of the Legal and Regulatory Committee. And I can't see the rest of my slide. No, sorry, period. Nicola is a member of the Legal and Regulatory Committee. So welcome, Shireen and Nicola. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to start off our presentation today by asking Shireen to talk a little bit about the key laws that affect companies in this industry. If you could just give us a short overview, Shireen, of the framework uh, to help us set the table for the rest of the conversation. Yeah, I would be happy to. So um, data privacy and protection is now like a very hot topic, but it's been around for a while. For those of us in the United States, we've seen a lot of laws that are more sectoral. So I think for some of us, we've seen, you know, the financial services industry and healthcare laws. Um, and then, of course, in the late 90s, the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, which is one that is still uh, relevant for this community. We've also seen um, in the last five years, I think, where we really saw comprehensive privacy laws come into play in where American companies in particular are started to get a little bit more aware about comprehensive privacy laws from the GDPR, which is the general data protection regulation in Europe for companies that were targeting uh, consumers in Europe and or based in Europe. Um, that was a probably a very fundamental change in how a lot of companies viewed how they were collecting co consumer data. And since that time, I have a quick slide to kind of show you what that, in the past five years, what has happened uh, in the world when it comes to the types of regulations um, similar to GDPR or um, that address a more comprehensive view of privacy. So if we could pop that up real quick, um, so we could show you like how many countries 
have passed these laws. So GDPR as, was enacted in 2016, but became effective in 2018. So last year it turned five years old. Um, and this slide kind of gives you um, a quick snapshot of what's happened in those five years from the uh, enforcement aspect. There have been some very big cases that came through with major fines. So that is the reason that I think a lot of um, those of us in America kind of woke up as like, oh, this is, you know, we have to start thinking about how we collect human consumer data and how we use it. Um, and several countries have followed suit. So at this point in time, we have 130 countries with privacy laws. A lot of countries follow uh, more like the GDPR, but here in the United States, um, our first state to pass a law was California, um, which became effective in 2020. And again, a lot of American companies um, had to start complying with that law, but many didn't because it had a threshold of how much business you're doing in California. However, if we wanna check the next slide, we're seeing um, many states start to pass those laws. So unlike the GDPR here in the United States, we still do not have a comprehensive privacy law at the federal level. So as I mentioned from the top, we do have a few that um, impact like financial information, health information, and then of course, children's information at the federal level, but not comprehensive uh, personal data. But um, if we can go to slide two, I can show you what the landscape looks like. For a while, it was just California. And then last year, California had updates and then we had five more states come on board. And this year we're gonna have several more states. So you can see in the green, those are states that have passed their laws and are becoming effective. Um, and then the blue is, those are states that still have laws in committee, but um, the trend is that this is not going away and we're either going to see a lot more green across the United States with comprehensive privacy laws um, versus um, them not, or, or eventually maybe a federal law. And what it deals with is consumer information so when you, uh, and it's personal information, right? So here in the United States, we have a consumer-based view, consumer protection-based view of what that is. And then in Europe, the view is that it's a human right, but it deals with your information, your name, your address, your location, um, email address in some instances, especially in Europe, anything that can identify you as a person um, is what these laws cover. And I have like two more slides and then we can start talking just to give you an overview of what we're talking about when we are talking about personal information. So if we look at slide three, it's really gives you an overview of what we're talking about when we talk about information. So it's really anything that can identify uh, a person or can link them back to a person. So that's a lot of information and it includes online identifiers and IP addresses um, under some of these laws. So it's a lot of different pieces that you have to think about. And I have one more slide that you guys can look at later, but it just gives you a broader category of what we're talking about, how those are categorized and how they might be treated under those laws. And basically, um, when we talk about data privacy laws, we're talking about companies obtaining information from consumers and what they do with that information and what rights consumers have um, with regard to that information. So um, you really need to think about what you're collecting, why you're collecting it, and then um, make sure you have controls in place to allow consumers to exercise their rights to either have their information deleted um, or restricted in some way. So that's kind of the overview of, of the landscape of what we're looking at and that um, it's not going anywhere, right? <laughs> so we need to start thinking about how that works. And I know um, it's it's a lot to, to digest really quickly in five minutes. <laughs> Thanks, Shereen. That's, it's helpful though to sort of set the table and, and give everybody a framework for the, the rest of the conversation. Um, but let's, let's jump to Nicholas because he's on the, uh, the sharp end of the spear, as they say. Um, I, somebody says that, right? Um, Nicholas, can you tell us you know, in your business, what are the laws that have most, uh, the data protection laws that have most impacted uh, the way that you deploy 
deploy your your app yeah in our case i mean it's a communication app so we we don't restrict to a specific country i mean it's, it's basically worldwide every user uh, can use it it's it's made for esport and gamers so we have to take care of the edge of the people as well so that's as a startup we're just building a product at the same time we need to cover all that thing at the same time uh what's happening on the on the privacy policy and thermal condition and actually this morning i was reviewing our own privacy policy to, to update them uh, um uh and so the two key things in our in our case is i mean edge edge is very important i mean you need to have privacy policy and we 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 take the gdpr as a reference because i mean we are worldwide we want to take the most stringent one and we will to do something per per country or per state. I mean, as a startup company, we have like it's impossible to do. I'm, I'm doing, you know, I'm doing the privacy policy myself, so <laughs> I kind of start to dig into any any of the specific state uh, aspects. And so we're taking the most hardest one, and also taking good practice from from player. And you see it, you, you just say that there's a lot of player in the US who got huge find. But it's also a very good player. Uh, I mean, taking really good care of their privacy policy. I just want to mention SoundCloud because that's their their privacy policy is amazing. It's very well explanatory, very well taking care of all the information of the user and so on. I mean, it's it's, it's really amazing. So we we take this as as a basis, still adjust it to our application. But I mean, the issue is in our in our app, we have everything. You got an audio, you got a video, you got a chat, you got a everything you can imagine in terms of communication between people and information. We don't take health information because we don't need, but a lot of the communication aspect, we have it and we need to take care of what do we do with this information? Do we store them? Do we store them? Yes, no, where do we store them? And so right now we are kind of rebuilding on the way. We don't have the answer yet to everything. I mean, we took care of the, of the basics and for us, the basic is again, the edge asking for the defining the minimum edge in our side we said that that's 16. Uh, we don't want anybody below 16 to be in an app otherwise it start to be localized maybe when we grow we will we'll start localizing uh people and and, and defining different rules for this but right now it's not uh, it's really not an option uh, um and and what do we do with the data uh do we store them we don't store them trying to really minimize the amount of data we collect, just the one that we need to perform better uh, as an app, as a communication app. For example, we need to understand, you know, the, the, the network issue between people where it's coming from. Uh, can we improve our algorithm for this network? But that's not linked to specific person. It's more like a general statistics. So we try to get statistics instead of having specific individual information. But I say so, we don't we don't have the answer for everything yet. We're building on the time and building on the most important thing and, and, and trying to be better than other in a market, even if this other have received like hundreds of millions of dollars uh, as investment. Uh, but we really taking care of the of the use of that. That's part of that's part of our, actually our, our marketing as well. Uh, that's part of strong belief. But also, it's very market, very strong marketing differentiator. We don't use the data of the user to do promotion left and right, and surely not for so get uh, beyond the privacy information that we need. So, what you know, part of what I'm hearing from you, Nicholas, is that there's just a lot to do, especially you know, given that you have a platform that's accessible worldwide. Um, and maybe subject to the laws of many different jurisdictions. Um, Shireen, how do you recommend to approach that issue? The fact that there's so much to do in so many jurisdictions, especially for you know folks in this industry, where you know that the products that you're putting out or the services they're providing are not constrained by jurisdiction. Yeah, well, I think Nicholas hit it on the head, right? So, for example. The fact that he's focusing on uh, having their privacy practices mapping to GDPR because currently that is the most stringent uh, framework in the world. 
um, and a lot of countries have followed it. So if you are putting controls in place that comply with GDPR, um, then you're probably going to be okay in most countries. There's a few nuances, but um, you know that's why that's why you get counsel to kind of get you through those. But for the most part, um, in Europe, you have to opt in to certain things. The big issue that he was talking about on marketing, you know, making sure that you are providing the option for your customers to decide whether they can use your information for marketing. Um, I think the other point that he hit on on the nail is the the minimization. So for companies either um, you know that have been existing for a while or start starting up, um, I highly recommend doing your data inventory. What are you collecting? Why are you collecting it? Where is it going? Right? Are you storing it? Or are you not storing it? And um, you know only really get the information that you need in order to function. Um, appropriately, or if you have to keep some of it for regulatory reasons, um, you can do that too. I think the other thing that Nicholas mentioned was utilizing some other vendors who like, this is what they do, right? So they help you manage your data and put help you get those controls in place. So um, that is also, you know, something that you want to look at when you are building things out is who can help me manage this because it's a lot of development cost if you do it yourself <laughs> to get those controls in place. Um, it's a lot of, it's expensive regardless, but um, it's a lot easier to get those things in place when you're young and don't have a lot of data than it is down the line. But you know what the saying is, like the best time to plant a tree was yesterday and the second best time is today. So <laughs> that's really, but that's the framework. The framework is really knowing what you're getting, why you're getting it, do you need it all, how long do you need it, and where are you, where are you putting it? Once you have that, you can build the rest of your um, program. Okay, that's super. That's super useful. Um, so Nicholas, from your perspective as a startup founder, what are a couple of things that you wish you had known at the beginning of your journey? Yeah, I mean, from the regulatory standpoint and, and, and privacy, it's 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 really that there's a best practice in terms of you know age and, and in terms of what information uh, should be taken from the from the from the user and not be taken from the user. I mean, I've been recently I've been seeing that the some of the fine and some of the explanation. I mean, Discord's got a big fine in France. And when you read the fine, I mean, there is, it's not much, but they, should, they could have done it for sure. I mean, just basically removing some like sleeping, uh, sleeping account and so on. But just kind of the distractions of maybe you know, 20, 50 points, what should be done like in practice. And then from that practice, describing and making the privacy policy right now it's kind of the other way around say um it's kind of you write the privacy policy and say okay well, what does it apply to us uh but it's hard to make it like a checklist i mean a checklist is very useful when you develop an app so that's you know you can say to the developer okay have you done this yes no yes no that's much faster there so that's kind of checklists uh but tuned for my specific uh, application and usage which is you know communication app and be true for every usage. I think in, 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 in esports you have a you have different type. You have a type like a physical LAN event, and I'm sure they could have a checklist for them as well. Uh, online tournament, different checklists, or maybe like maybe ninety percent is the same. But and 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 just supporting software is like what we do, um, and, and that would be would have been super helpful to get this right at the beginning, and also internally because obviously this privacy policy, policy it's something that from a, a product standpoint and product development standpoint is always at kind of at the bottom of the of the task list because, because you say let's have a product first and then once we have a product we have users and then we need to take care of this but it's much easier just to simply put this in the development uh, path of the developer and so it's also about education internal education uh, educating people say, okay, I mean, we don't do this, we do this for a purpose, but also be careful because that could be a fine behind. I mean, we're doing for the user, but I mean, beyond this, I mean, these fines could be millions of dollars uh, if you become big. 
So that's right. um, just internal education would have been good. And um, maybe tune something for, for e-sport and for different categories of e-sport business. Shereen, what are, what are some common misperceptions that your clients have when they first come to you to talk about data protection laws? I think some of it is what, what applies and what do I, what do I need to do and what is the bare minimum? And I think, um, you know, that is one approach depending on where you are and what your reach is, right? For example, for regional folks here in the United States, that has been an approach that folks have used um, and, you know, did not want to comply with the California regulations. Um, because they didn't need to, right? They weren't doing enough business in California to do it. But we're getting to this tipping point where we're seeing these laws come into effect in many states. Um, the other flip side of that is they're collecting a lot of data that they don't need or they're storing it. And storing data is expensive. So even on the litigation side, I was formerly a litigator. If you have a lot of data, that means you have to produce it. So, um, you know, even if all of those laws don't apply to you, it's still better to have really good data protection and data minimization practices in place. So what we had just talked about earlier. And then I think for um, Nicholas's point, like we know this industry is trending younger, right? So we know there's a lot of youth and there are some interesting nuances when we're talking about teenagers, right? So in Europe and the, even the UK recently passed a law last year raising the age of a child to basically under 17. So basically anybody who's not considered an adult is a child where previously um, it was 13 or 14. Here in the United States under the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act, COPA, it's currently 13. However, in California, there is a separate law for 13 to 16 year olds. Right. So they have rights that are more similar to GDPR where they have to opt in, whereas adults um, generally have an option to opt out of marketing emails and other things. So um, it really you really need to think about who is your audience. Right. And so I think in this industry, we do need to really consider the age issue and how are you going to deal with it. Right. You need to make sure that you have your website policies, as Nicholas was talking about, your terms of service and your privacy notice that really explains what you're doing, who you're targeting. And then, um, you know, the fine issue, <laughs> which Nicholas was addressing, is the fines can be really hefty if you are not complying with these laws. So, um, you know, we had a recent case here in the United States with, um, with Epic and, and a COPA violation of not getting parental controls, and they have to be verifiable parental controls. So you have to have a technical... Um, piece that captures that you did receive parental uh, consent for the child's information to be given to the company and to be used in certain ways. So that is something that you have to discuss with your developers or find a vendor who can implement that for your, your product um, to make sure that you are tracking um, those consents. And in Europe, it's, it's the same. It's for adults as well. You have to get consent to utilize their information and you have to be able to produce that. When the regulators come, you have to have documentation to be able to show um, that you are, one, asking for consent and two, that you're tracking uh, the consent of consumers. So it is really important and the fines are steep. Um, I mean, we've seen millions and millions of dollars of fines. When you look back at that slide, uh, one, it was, you know, I mean, lots of money <laughs> that the regulators have fined these companies because, you know, it, it's it's important for them to show one, this they mean business, right? They're they're protecting their citizens' rights to have their private privacy protected, and that they mean business with these regulations. And we've seen the same thing here. We've seen statements from the California AG that you know I think they're going to start enforcements uh, this year. So, you know, if you've been kind of waiting, like, I, I really feel like this is not the time to wait anymore. And we're seeing um, more states and countries implement these laws um, and trying to figure out the enforcement piece 
and are using, um, uh, or not using, it's a big stick. Yeah. That when they find the violations, like they are going to um, find those companies and make sure that everybody knows that they mean business. Well, and I'll, I'll throw in um, from my background uh, as a white collar defense attorney back in the day that one thing that I think people don't fully take into account is the cost of being investigated. Um, you know, subpoena response, interviews, follow up letters, all of that um, can can have a pretty hefty price tag associated in legal fees. So even if you don't get fined or the fines are low, um, there still can be a pretty high cost to to triggering an investigation from from a regulator. Um, and and some of these laws are give individual consumers the right to sue. And so defensive litigation, when you're sued by a consumer, also can have a pretty high cost. So again, even if you win that lawsuit, um, you still have to pay to defend it, um, at least in the US, which can be pretty costly. Um, what, um, you know, switching to another topic, another hot topic of the day, um, what are the legal implications? Well, I'll throw this out for Shireen, but Nicholas, I'll be interested also in whether you at Sonics, if you guys have considered this, um, you know, everyone is incorporating AI into not only their back room or their, their back office applications, but their consumer facing applications. Um, you know, every day I see a new, a new uh, service saying now with AI, Bing, I think says now with AI. Um, so what, what are the legal implications of using AI in data processing and protection? Either, again, if you're using AI for your business processes or if you're offering AI um, as part of your service. Uh, yes. So we're definitely seeing regulation there as well. Um, and I think the main concern is ensuring that these tools are not processing data in a way that ends up discriminating against people. So, you know, making sure that um, it's not making decisions that it ends up with a discriminatory or a disparate treatment of people is really what they're looking at. So um, when you're thinking about the AI tools, how they're going to process the data and what's coming out, you really want to think about um, what are you using it for and is it going to create um you know, an unintended consequence just based on how it's coded or how you might have uh, implemented it. So, um, you know, those are fairly new. I'm still <laughs> wading through a lot of that. I know we've seen an executive order come out as well here in the United States. Uh, I know there's a whole new um, regulatory framework coming out of Europe as well. And then in California has addressed that and many of the other states have addressed it um, as well. But companies are still trying to kind of uh, grasp it. So where I where I mostly advise people is obviously on your employment side. Employment data is is really sensitive information. You get a lot of information from your employees, um, and then depending on what type of product or service that you're providing. I think in esports it's a little different because it's not some of those traditional um, industries where discrimination was was seen, like in the finance uh, area and maybe even medical or others. So um, you really just have to kind of think through what is my industry? What am I offering? How does this tool work? And are we seeing any patterns where it might be treating certain people differently? And then matching that up with laws that deal with disparate or discriminatory treatment. Um, so, what about, I mean, it's fun to use new technology, but you have to you have to know what it's doing. Yeah, I was going to say, what about the use of publicly available information? And, and especially this has become a topic in AI where, where AI scrapes uh, publicly available information off the Internet and then, you know, processes it, um, you know, in its in its programming is is can publicly available information be subject to restrictions under data protection laws? I think it depends on whether it was supposed to be public. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, that's another issue with, with businesses is making sure that you know what certain tools are doing, right? We've seen a lot of litigation in the last couple of years with Metapixel, 
out of out of Meta that is accessing data that it probably should not be making public. Um, and so I think that's the other issue is like, you really have to understand what are these tools? What are they accessing? And is it inadvertently providing information uh, out in the public that it should not be? So that's again, knowing what you have and knowing what your tools have access to and what they're doing with it. And in, in our case, I mean, we're basically using AI both from the product side I mean, that's underlying, it's not like available to public, but we're doing like, for example, AI noise counseling and we train our algorithm. I mean, that's the training parts is where do you get the, your information from the data from. And so we, and that's one part of it, but it's kind of, we train it on very like public domain that you pay basically to access those, those, those data set. And so that, that's pretty easy. It's not like linked to any, 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 any picture and photo and video, which is much more tricky. But in our case, the data set of audio recording, which exists when you pay for it. And the second part of the AI we're, we're, we're building right now is to, I mean, also on the data transmission, when you transmit information through the network, I mean, some, some data will be lost. How do you recreate artificially this data on the other side? That uh, could be a, a jingle, it could be a full sentence. I mean, based on, on how you train your algorithm, based on what's people are saying, and that's specific to every industry, you know, in esports, like in general, in every industry, uh, uh, you always say the same thing more or less. So it's very, it's very ideal for AI because you train in speech and you know, like this, this word goes after this word, like 99% of the time. So that, that's super specific. So this, and, and, and also where do we get our information from? And that also some part on the audio part, you can get, you can buy it and, and pay for it. And so that's we pretty pretty safe on, on this side. But the other question uh, of sharing is that the other part of which we need to implement uh, it's moderation. I mean, most likely will be just be an AI moderator. Uh, and then where do you put the bias? And I was discussing with another startup here in in, uh, in Boston. It's called Modulate, and they do this. They basically analyze the voice, that means the sentences and so on. And based on this, you can on your own define trigger point. I do we want to be very aggressive that any bad word just trigger an alert or do I want to have any, maybe more flexibility? And they have like 10, 20 criteria, uh, which are you no know, set by the company who are using the AI moderation, but where are those AI, uh, came from that, that the question of how, of, how much the training of the algorithm came from that's an issue. I mean, just to different field, but the same, same aspect, but focusing on the specific community, we, we said to, uh, uh, to meet journey, they give me 10 pictures of a French, French guy, you know, where the, where the, where the baguette and where the beret and uh, <laughs> all the cliche you can imagine in the world. And that's completely biased. And it could be biased for a specific country, but it could be biased for a specific genre, uh, gender, it could be biased for a specific uh, age and so on. And that's, that's really the, the issue of the bias of the AI. Potential yeah, that's super, that's super interesting, especially the application as a as a AI moderator and how bias could change the way it it interprets uh, different conversation tone of voice and, and inject bias into that moderation process. Um, so, Shireen, we talked about and you showed us a great slide on um, states that have data protection laws, but you know, we, and we talked about, you know, ways to comply with data protection laws. But the other thing that we hear about, you know, every day there's a new data breach. So, you know, how many states have laws about data breach? And for, for folks that don't already have a robust data protection program and a, an incident response plan, what's the like one or two things you think they should know about data breach in case it happens to them? Yes. So as I mentioned before, the data inventory and mapping is super important because you need to know where everything is. And then, of course, when you do detect a breach, you need to know what to do. So if we just go back for a second, your data protection program starts with your data map. Then you can have your policies and procedures, which would be your privacy notice, public facing and internal facing, like how your employees deal with that data. And then you can build off that with 
an incident response plan. And that basically is at the time that your data is breached, because it will happen, what do you do, right? So there are a few people that you want to have on speed dial. You're going to want an attorney who deals with incident response because every state has a law of when you have to report that from the date that you know it, right? And some of those are very quick turnarounds. I think 72 hours is probably a safe number that encompasses a lot of states, but they vary from state to state. So it's really important that you have somebody who knows what those are and can walk you through that. The other issue, you know, if you're a bigger company, small companies, this might not work, but for bigger companies, we recommend a PR firm, right, to help you craft your communication, right? And it's okay to tell people you're still investigating. Like, there's no need to provide additional information when you don't know what the answer is. You don't know if you don't know who has the info. You know, we saw a lot of ransomware attacks last year, um, and it took a while to figure out who did it, where the data is, and how much they actually got. So it's not helpful to you to make a lot of statements when you still don't know the answers, right? The main point is we've identified a breach. We have a team. We've notified of the authorities. Like those are the, those are the main keys. And I think some things that people might not realize when we talk about data breach or cybersecurity, um, there are some interesting agencies that are involved. So of course the FBI in the United States but also the Secret Service is a huge player in uh, data breaches, depending on what type of data it is and whether it's a national security threat. So um, for clients, I have done those meetings where we meet our local um, FBI field agent and our local Secret Service agent. Of course, you want to know your local uh, police department as, as well, depending on what type of breach it is, um, so that you already have those relationships in place. Um, but it is, um, you know, it happens to, first of all, it happens to everybody. So like, you just need to be prepared. And I think the other piece is cyber insurance <laughs> for businesses. Like you really need to get cyber insurance. Like we're at a point in time where it's not a matter of if it's a matter of when and cyber insurance will really help cover you if that's a situation, because responding to data breaches is ex extremely expensive um, and, you know, those insurance providers might also provide you with some of those resources um, that I just talked about. Yeah, because some states require that you provide uh, credit monitoring for anybody impacted. You know, there, there's in addition to the investigation and, and uh, you know, the, the patching of whatever the issue was, there can be, uh, you know, requirements uh, under state law that are, you know, out of pocket costs. Right. Um, and should you wait just just to let's let's nail this down and be perfectly clear. Should you wait until you understand what happened before you call your lawyer, call your PR person, figure out whether you need to report the breach to uh, various state or federal agencies? No, the answer is no. Like as soon as you know that there's been a breach of any kind, uh, you should get your uh, incident response plan should get in action, right? And internally, you probably have certain folks, your CEO, your chief compliance officer, and your uh, chief information security officer are definitely going to be your first points of contact. And then you're going to notify uh, an attorney who can help you determine what notification you, you need to give to what states and um, what the timeline is for providing those notifications. If you wait, you will be subject to fines for waiting. So it's better to report and say, oh, we had this breach. And if it turns out that there was no sensitive data um, impacted, then that's okay, right? Like you've done your duty of making the response. But um, I think that, no, waiting never helps. So one last question on data breach. Um, you know, I think when when I hear the, the term data breach, I think of, you know, an outside attack, a ransomware attack, a hack, but are there other things that could count as a data breach, which are less, uh, you know, less obvious or may not be quite as intuitive, um, like an employee who steals a laptop or loses a thumb drive or that sort of thing? Do those count as data breaches? I don't I literally don't know. I mean, I mean, it depends on what what was taken and what controls you have in place. Like, hopefully, if you do have 
employees with laptops, you have a way to shut those down and wipe them fairly quickly. Um, but yes, I mean, and it is possible, even monitoring downloads from employees who shouldn't have access um, to that information. So um, it really varies from state to state what is considered a notifiable data breach. Um, but if you know somebody has taken sensitive information, like you need to figure out what that is and um, make sure that you know what your timeline is. And it's it's not long. I mean, we're talking two to three days in which you have to make a notification to the state. So that is um, an important point. Awesome. Um, so we're, we're rolling up. Uh, I'm going to get some last comments from you guys and then uh, open up for Q&A. So Shireen, Talk to us about what you think the trends are and, you know, for for industry members who are trying to look ahead and be prepared, what should they be looking for? What, what are we expecting around the corner? I think what we're expecting around the corner is many more states here in the United States passing comprehensive privacy laws. We may eventually see a federal law, but I'm, I don't see that before 2025, at least. Um, we're seeing a lot of, I, I think for our members, the area that we are really seeing a lot of activity is in the children's privacy area. We're seeing, you know, as I said, we saw countries lift the age of a child to really anybody who's under an adult. There was a federal legislation here in the U.S. that wanted to do that with COPA. I don't think that the new rulemaking includes lifting the age, but that is a trend and something I wanted to highlight for our members is that there is currently the Federal Trade Commission is accepting comments on updates to the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. So that's something we're going to be asking for your input about. It just came out. So uh, there's a few different uh, items that might be of interest, but I did not see the raising of the age yet. I think that would have to be in a separate um, legislation where Congress passes it. But I do feel that that had a lot more traction than the comprehensive privacy law of because of what we're seeing with teenagers being online and some of the impact uh, with them. So I think that's a big area. And then we're just seeing more and more countries around the world uh, pass these laws. So in like Nicholas said, you know, this is a global industry. It's a way that um, a lot of our uh, folks that are engaged in esports are from all over the world and communicating with each other um, and just knowing um, that we we're having data transfer across borders. That's another issue that we didn't get to touch on, but it's a big issue in this area. So uh, for example, if you are collecting information from Europe, you need to know whether you can transfer that information out of Europe or not, um, or if you need to have a local server. A lot of companies have decided to try and host that information in Europe so they don't have to deal with the transfer, even though we currently have a framework in place that hasn't been overruled, but um, it, the United States, um, we just don't think of privacy in the same way and Europeans um, fight for their rights. So I think those are the trends that we're gonna see um, and, and we're seeing it with other countries is the data transfer issue of whether you can transfer data out of the countries or not. So I think the top issues are, it's not going anywhere. <laughs> so, you know, buckle up and start thinking about how you're going to comply with these laws. Um, children's information is, is really a highlight right now. I mean, we've seen in the last two years from ed tech to gaming, the Federal Trade Commission is really active in this area of protecting children's information here in the United States. And then we saw it in the legislation that was passed in the UK, raising the age of a child. So I think, um, and then data transfers, those are, those are the high level trends that we're seeing coming through. Awesome. So I would like to make a note on the uh, COPA, the children's online personal, what is it on Co <laughs> children's online personal privacy, privacy? Pri privacy protection act. Ah, privacy protection act. Uh, on the comments for that. How long is the comment period open? It's open till March 11th. Um, okay. And yeah, we can get a summary. I, I haven't fully digested everything, but um, we will get a summary together. We will likely work together to yeah, figure out so, who to make a response. 
So if, um, if you're a member of ESTA and you would like ESTA to make a comment, to submit comments to uh, the proposed regulation, um, please fill out, Megan just posted or reposted the link to the comment form that you can use. Um, this is, this falls really squarely within uh, the, the kind of thing that we think legal and regulatory can do for uh, for its members. And it's, it's sort of a, a classic activity of a trade association is to submit comments on behalf of its members to proposed uh, regulations. So um, if you're interested in uh, ESTA submitting comments on behalf of the industry or on behalf of the membership, please fill out the uh, COPEC comment form. And we'll, we'll take that input and work with Shireen and the rest of our members to craft a uh, comment on behalf of the, uh, the trade association. Um, Nicolas, on, on the sort of future proofing and what's around the corner, what are you guys focused on uh, in this in this realm for the next uh, year or two yeah, years? Yeah, I mean, right now we've been focusing on the first phase of, of, of Sonix, what the, what the, just the communication part and, and on the privacy side, just to make the, the basics, you know, the basics in terms of age, in terms of where the data are being stored, which data minimizing the, the number of data. I mean, that's, it's not really work at science. If you take the three things already, it's already a lot of, a lot of good face that you put in the process. Um, and then from our side, we're going also to the next step in the sense that our app is communication part is part of it. But then the second part is to create a marketplace for esports team to propose and promote digital asset to their fan base, which doesn't exist today. I mean, you cannot just brand your communication app with, with eSports uh, digital asset. And that would be the first one. And that's, so then it's all for us, but okay, digital assets are coming from eSports organizations. They own those assets. Uh, um, and so it's really, I mean, there's copyright behind, uh, for sure there's the right aspect. So it's just evolving our term and condition and privacy policy to this. Because ultimately, I mean, we're going to start with esports teams, but it will grow to gaming organization. I mean, it could be a publisher also want to provide digital asset to the fan base and then completely opening the marketplace to user generated content. Any fan, any gamer can create their own digital assets and pushing them on a marketplace to just promote them because they are, they are cool designs. Um, and so that's another level in terms of you know who owns what uh, copyright aspects um how you protect those things do we protect them through just a copyright aspect or do we plug them into into a blockchain so that this blockchain can be in protect those assets and uh, asset on the ip level but also because in part of the blockchain you get an nft out of it i mean just digital tokenization of it and you can trade those one and so it's it's a different uh, it's a different aspect, but we are training and we see in video games we we completely full into digital asset right now. There was some attempt to put NFT, but not in the same aspect of protecting content. And so we are coming with saying, okay, you have content that are unique. You generate this. You are you are designers. You design an asset, and and that's your that's your IP. That's it. Or do you protect it and how do you value it? Or do you create value out of it or do you trade it afterwards? Um, and so that's this regulation start to be there, but it's not like uh, fully focused. And, and so what if those, I mean, there's another level is what if those digital assets are being created by AI on this side? So right. you can have like everything can be pretty complex and, and building up and we're not here to make the law but we have to follow it uh and, and to see the trend to adapt to it and to make it us you know our best thinking that this should be the good in terms of we're always putting our shoes in a, in a place of a consumer and the creator on the other side i mean both have to benefit from it and both have to be uh right have to have the right level of protection on their ip it could be personal information ip if you wish or, or, or generated content IP. That's for the second phase, yeah. which will come pretty soon, actually. It should come. Uh, I mean, the first marketplace actually being released next week. So, Ooh, that's exciting. Cool. Um, 
Well, so that that's the end of our uh, sort of uh, planned conversation. Um, I don't see any questions. Lindsay, do we have any questions from, uh, do we call it the audience, the participants, the viewers? I don't see anything. Let me see. I don't see any questions in the chat. I had I had one other point to to sure. make that I think we kind of brushed over. But when we were talking about your relationships with your vendors, um, there are certain regulations that require that you have what's called the data protection addendum attached to the contracts. So. Uh, and that basically explains how your service providers um, are going to use the data. Because as you all know, when you're starting up a company or running a company, like you don't do it all yourself. You're going to hire vendors and service providers to help you. And a lot of them will have access to certain types of data. And depending on what they have access to, you need to make sure that your contracts um, provide that those companies have appropriate privacy and data protection controls in place. and um, how things are going to go down. If there is a breach, who's responsible and how you guys are going to work together uh, when that happens. So I just wanted to throw that out there. And a lot of like the bigger players, I know Nicholas, we chatted before, you know, dealing with Google or, um, you know, some of these bigger companies, they do actually have certain controls in place in the way that you set up certain tools where you can, can select to make them a service provider and then initiate some of those controls that need to be in place when you are utilizing their services. So that is something to be aware of and to know that if you're gathering or sharing certain information with your service providers to make sure that you know that they have the right controls in place. That's a great point. And also sort of the other side of that coin is if you are a B2B uh, company, um, you know, a lot of times what we see with our clients is that it's their customers that drive their data protection program because their customers have higher needs than they do. And so they end up needing to level up their data protection compliance to meet the needs of their customers um, because it, the same demands are being made of them is to enter into contracts that that show that they have certain protections in place. So it kind of it kind of works both ways. It's a great point. Um, Lindsay, oh wait, she has. There's a comment in the private chat. We we don't have any questions from the audience, um, so we're going to wrap up. I think are there announcements that I need to make? Um, if you want to learn more about the Esports Trade Association, um, you can go to esportsta.org. Um, learn more about what the Esports Trade Association uh, will does for its members and how to how to become a member of the Esports Trade Association. Also, registration is open for the Esports Next 2024 conference presented by Coca-Cola on July 7 through 9. Discounts will be available for members. If you go to esportsnext.gg, you can see info more information about the conference and purchase tickets. And, you know, for my part, I'd like to say it's a great event um, here in Chicago, one of the best cities in the country. No offense to anybody else. Um, so if you can make it July 7 to 9, you definitely should try. Also join us for our upcoming virtual coffee connections on Wednesday, February 7 at 9 a.m. Central Time. You can find uh, the events calendar on the website, esportsta.org. And also if you follow on LinkedIn, you'll be notified of upcoming events. To provide feedback for the Legal and Regulatory Committee, please email the office at info at esportsta.org or use the link uh, that was dropped in the comments for the feedback form. And with that, I'd like to thank everybody for attending and especially thank Nicola and Shireen for participating in our panel today. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.